Professor Herman Simon is a legend to those of us who work in thought leadership. The firm he helped launch in 1985, Simon Kucher and Partners, today is the world's leader in pricing strategy consulting. It's a $500 million privately held company with 1,600 employees and more than 40 offices around the world. In the firm that I led before Boudet Thought Leadership Partners, Bloom Group, my colleagues and I had the opportunity to work with Simon Kucher and Partner on a book called Monetizing Innovation. It was there that I first saw this firm's depth in pricing strategy. Herman Simon led Simon Kucher and Partners as CEO until 2009, when its revenues had grown to about $100 million and he continued to play an influential role for many years after as chairman. He has written more than 40 books to date. Many of the books are about the topic of pricing. Herman is the only German in the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame, a group that recognizes the world's most influential thinkers on management issues. In our Everything Thought Leadership interview, I talked with Herman about the key things that enabled Simon Kucher and partners to carve out a lucrative position in the world of pricing strategy consulting, what he sees as Simon Kucher's thought leadership investments that had the greatest impact on the company when he was CEO, the value of publishing books in the overall thought leadership content and marketing mix, what motivated him to write one of his more recent books, what he sees as Simon Kucher's key success factors going forward, and what research topics he's most interested in today. Herman, it's a real honor and pleasure to uh, be sitting here with you via Zoom and talking about your illustrious career. So welcome. Bob, nice to see you again. I look forward to our discussion. You know, the, my first question is about the consulting firm that you co-founded back in 1985, Simon Kucher and Partners. Simon Kutcher Partners, uh, which carved out a very deep and, and very profitable niche in the global market of, of management consulting around pricing strategy. And since then, everything related to pricing strategy, which is a lot, corporate strategy, marketing, uh, innovation, product and service innovation, and, and other things that touch pricing, either loosely or, or very closely. So you were up against much bigger consulting firms in the mid '80s when you and your and your business partners launched the firm: McKinsey, Bain, A.T. Carney, um, others, who I imagine had pricing people, maybe pricing practices, um, who had been dealing with pricing issues on behalf of their clients. So I guess the question is: How were you able to carve out such a a great niche and build? Uh, such a strong company in the midst of lots of competition early on? I go back one step, how it came all about. Uh, as a young professor in 1979, I visited uh, Philip Kotler at Northwestern University, the global marketing guru. And I had done research in pricing, published some papers, and I explained it to him and said, but I would like to have some impact on practice. And he said, every researcher, every academic, every academic wants to have impact on practice, but hardly anybody achieves that. But I know one guy in Chicago who calls himself price consultant. That was totally new for me, that you could make a living from consulting on price. So that... Uh, turned around in my head, and uh, we founded Simon Kutcher and Partners with the idea to position us very pointedly as price consultants. And we were the pioneer. The guy in Chicago that was uh, a self employed uh, loan fighter, very, very good, very practical. He did not build a company. And uh, so we, we started. So I think the first point is that we were the pioneer focused on pricing. The general management consultancy, they did everything, but they didn't. They had a few pricing specialists, but nobody perceived them. It was rather a job on the side within a bigger consulting project. And when you then uh, describe the various aspects of pricing, innovation, um, competition, etc. There's one 
common denominator. And I've been asked this question thousands of times. What is the most important aspect of pricing? And I've always the same answer. It's value, or more precisely, value to customer, perceived value to customer. We are the experts to measure, to quantify, to define value. And from this value, we derive the price. So the price is the result of better understanding, of creating, of quantifying the value. And behind that is a more general lesson. The specialist always or mostly beats the generalist. So when people think of pricing today, wherever in the world it is, they think of Simon Kutcher, they don't think of McKinsey or Boston or Bain. Of course, these large companies do pricing on the, on the side within uh, the context of bigger projects, but we are the specialists, and I think we have occupied this niche in the brains of our clients. Yeah, yeah. In the early years, late 80s, early 90s, did you ever, you and your colleagues ever spend, you know, sleepless nights or some discussions at the office saying, in so many words, worrying about, well, McKinsey is going to get serious about a pricing practice or Boston Consulting Group or Bain or A.T. Kearney or some other consulting firm. Did you ever worry about that? And if you did, what were your thoughts about how to deal with that competition in, in pricing? In the first 10 years, we did not worry about, we were simply too small to be at all uh, perceived or registered by the big guys. But say after 15 years, uh, they uh, learned to know us. We were sometimes in pitches, we won some projects. And just recently, I heard from the former head of McKinsey Germany, that in 1998, that was 13 years after we started, we won a very big project from Mercedes. And that this really annoyed him. I learned that only a few weeks ago. And uh, of course, some of them have tried, especially Boston Consulting, to set up special pricing practices to go more into uh, this field. But so far, that hasn't hurt us. Another new competition are software companies who do special software for pricing. And there, we established our own software uh, division two years ago in order to be able to compete on that front. Because clients are more and more demanding that we do not only develop the concept, but also supply the software which they need to implement it. Um, so that is a kind of, of new competition, and uh, we are now often in pitches with the big ones, and when it's, uh, the project is focused on pricing, we have a very good chance to win. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about your thought leadership investments. You know, during the time you were CEO, especially which ones uh, you believe had the biggest impact, even if you couldn't measure the impact. Which ones you, you felt and others felt had the biggest impact and why they had the impact? Which of those investments mattered more than others? Uh, of course, I built on my publications and speeches during my academic career. I was a professor for 16 years and published a couple of articles in the top journals like Journal of Marketing Research, Management Science, Harvard Business Review, et cetera. So we built on this. So I, I was, and also some of my doctoral students who joined Simon Butcher were already quite well known in the academic world. And then in the first years, our main industry was pharmaceuticals. And, and that's a very global, very international industry. So we got for, to be known also in America, not only in Europe, in the pharmaceutical industry, because we uh, worked for most of the large companies. And then there are specific events. For instance, in, in Germany, we really got famous through a project for the German Railroad Corporation. In, in German, railroad is Bahn, and we created the Bahn card. Costs uh, a little over 500 dollars 
And why do I buy this card? Because it gives me a discount of 50% on all tickets for the duration of one year. So I spend $500 to buy the right for this discount. And today, more than 6 million people own this card. And that was revolution. And when, when people portray me today in, in Germany, journalists, etc., they always write uh, the inventor of the bond card. So that was for Germany. And uh, in, in other uh, sectors, uh, for instance, in, in the Silicon Valley, we have about 40 unicorns in Silicon Valley as clients. And uh, wow. when you, when you uh, come to a new one and say, uh, we are uh, working for Uber, for Airbnb, et cetera, that opens the door. So references and uh, also lots of speeches at, at all kinds of conferences. It's, it's not a single article, book, or event which has built this sort of leadership, but there are many, many building stones, small ones, bigger ones, and it's accumulating over time. Do you think it would have been a slower climb to where you guys are now, which is uh, 500 million US? I mean, 22 last year, US dollar. Would it have been a slower climb to from 1985, zero to 2022, 21, 500 million? It would have been a slower climb had you not done the books and the speeches and um, you and your colleagues, you know, and all, all the things to become a quote unquote thought leader. If you had largely stayed silent and hoped to get more work from existing clients and references in that. Certainly it would have been slower. That is especially true for new countries. For instance, we are in a very early stage in China. We have three offices in China, but they are still small. Our books have been published and, and, and sold in very large numbers in China. And just a few days ago, uh, one of the partners in China informed me, a, a company, actually a global market leader in Kashmir, they read my book, Confessions of Surprising Man, and they called us and uh, we got a project for that. Wow. How do you reach people? You reach people through speeches, uh, books, articles in a country where you are new and almost by definition unknown. And their books are extremely helpful and in Asia even more than in America because Asians still read more books than Westerners. Did you ever get at, at, at Simon Kutcher uh, when you were running it, did you ever, or even afterwards, did you ever get people in the firm who were saying, Herman, because I've heard this in other firms, Herman, you're giving away too much in these books. If, if they read a book, they won't, bring, they won't need to bring us in to do consulting. Did you ever hear that? And if so, how did you respond to that? Very, very rarely. And my response is very clear. The book creates tastes, but does not provide the practical solution. So another way to look at it, the book is the grocery store sample, the sample they ha hand out to you in the grocery yes. store to get you yes. to buy the, uh, uh, yes. so you've published numerous books and others in Simon Kutcher, um, Madhavan and uh, Georg with Monetizing Innovation have published books. How do you look at the value of books in Simon Kutcher's overall thought leadership marketing mix? You had not published books, but you'd done public speaking and articles and you know, would the impact do you think had been as great as it has been? If you look at the how thought leadership is developing, is being built, there are different qualities. For instance, references of very good companies are a valuable building stone. Books are very specific in this regard. First, Having written a book is something special. Not so many people write books, even in consultancies, not many people right. write books, are usually a few. And um, books different from articles have a long life. Ideally, the manager has a shelf in his room and the book is sitting there and he sees it occasionally. Or he may... Uh, 
look at it occasionally. So this long life uh, is, is a very important aspect of continuous uh, thought leadership building. And uh, we did something else. We tried to occupy the whole landscape of pricing. So we have very basic books like uh, this one, Confessions of the Pricing Man, partly, by the way, stolen from David Ogilvy. Confessions of an Advertising Man, sure. Confessions of an Advertising Man. I was a little more courageous and said The Pricing Man. Uh, a book focusing on innovation, like the one you mentioned, monetizing innovation. And then a textbook, price management, 600 pages, very quantitative, also rather theoretical. So we occupy the, the range from a very basic book up to the, to the standard textbook. And, and that's another way not to let too many others uh, occupy this uh, this landscape. So going forward on, on books in the thought leadership marketing mix, going forward the rest of the decade, do you think books will, will remain to be a key element of this thought leadership marketing mix? And if so, why? Or if not, why? That is a very, very important and uh, Hot question. And I have to admit, I do not know the answer. Perhaps I'm old fashioned. I, I, I love writing books. I'm, I'm writing books. I just finalized one beating inflation, very hot. The German version comes out next week and the American version will follow in, in about two months. But I'm also asking myself, I, am I fallen out of the time? Do young people still read books? Or do we have to use uh, digital media, et cetera? We do that also. Uh, and uh, I have already done one thing differently in my most recent books that I make the chapters very short, that you can read a chapter in 10 minutes, in, in bits every day, a little, a, a little bit. Instead of having very long chapters of 20 or 30 pages, now they have five or six pages. So I try to adjust, but I honestly do not know whether I am on the right track. I, I write, I read many books, but do the 20, 30, 40 year old uh, people in our target group still read books? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. I mean, it's a difficult question to answer. I mean, my view on it is that, um, as you said, books are hard for most people to write. Most consulting firms don't write one book. Even the biggest consulting firms, they're not publishing hundreds of books. They may write, publish less than 10 or less than five. The biggest ones, McKinsey. One reason, if I may add, internally, Book writing is not respected, rather negatively sanctioned in many consulting firms. There, there may be envy or that they don't believe in the effect of books. Why do you think that um, many management consulting firms don't get behind books? What is it? Is it the time it takes a consultant or two or three? They're 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 away from client work or or you know what? I simply think that most consultants cannot write books. They don't have the patience or the endurance. I mean, on a normal book, you may work for, for several years. And then they don't want that their colleagues write books instead of doing consulting and may become famous through the books. <laughs> that right. is, in my opinion, the, the mechanism which uh, doesn't favor book writing in the context of consultancies. Yeah. And um, the more I admire people like Madhavan and uh, George Tucker, who really have written an excellent book. Yeah, it was an excellent book. And they um, one of the most powerful aspects of that book, I felt, in addition to their, their theories, was the case studies that they presented. Yes, yes. It was right. full of deep case studies of company, especially the Porsche, the Cayenne, LinkedIn, uh, and others. That really brought those ideas to life. Okay, so you know, outstanding question of how important will books be for the rest of the decade in the thought leadership marketing mix? Um, let's turn to your your most recent book, 
Well, your most recent book will be the one on inflation that's coming out. True Profit came out last year. Last year. Yeah. It's True Profit. No company ever went broke turning a, turning a profit. What motivated you to write this book on this topic? An, an interesting story. Uh, some years ago, I received a, a honorary doctorate from a German university. And I gave a speech there on profit. And I, I sent this speech to, to many people. I never got so much feedback as for this article or speech. I said, you have to write, that was 10 pages. You have to write, and, and it took a couple of years until I found the time to write it. And the interesting thing is, there's hardly any book on profit. This is, I, I can say, this is the only book which really is a pure profit book. I mean, everybody uh, talks about profit. Uh, it's the most important indicator of business success, but we don't have a book on profit. And the reason is, in my opinion, that all the, the, the business professors or the people who write on business are specialists for marketing or finance, and profit is a common general denominator of a company. And we have no more generalists for management. They're all specialists human resources, organization, or whatever it means. And uh, this led me to, to write this book, the, the, the feedback to my speech and my article at, uh, at, at this uh, occasion of the honorary doctorate. And why do you think it, this, this issue of profit uh, resounded so well? What, what was it, did you, what did you hear from them about, what, what was it about that speech that they say, this is really good? I said very clearly that companies should be profit-oriented and uh, defended profit maximization. Mm -hmm. And if you say that in a, in, in a society, wherever you are, you will provoke a very hot discussion. People are against profit and profit maximization. And people have totally wrong perceptions and notions of profit. For instance, we did a survey, and there are many surveys of this kind, that ask people, what is the net profit after all costs and all taxes? That's for Germany. People in the street said 22%. The true profit number, that's why I call it true profit, is 3.4%. In the United States, People in the street believe that companies make a net margin of 31%, even more than in Germany. The true number is 4.95% over the years. In it Italy, the record holder is 38%, what people believe, and it's around 5% as well. So profit seems to be a mysterious issue. People have totally wrong ideas about profitability. And that was also one of my uh, gold there to, to, to get the record straight. One specific issue of, of uh, America is that you have some extremely profitable companies, especially the tech companies, some banks, and uh, the oil companies. And they kind of, of misguide the perception of our profits. But what Apple has a margin of more than 20 percent has nothing to do with the reality of 99% of all American companies. They are on the average uh, 4.9%. Right, or Facebook for that matter, or Google. Of course, these are the superstars, which I also cover in this book. But uh, the, the, the normal company uh, cannot be guided by what Apple does and in terms of profitability of investment capabilities and resources, etc. And uh, so the Definition I love, which actually goes back to Peter Trucker, is profit is the cost of survival. Yes. You have to consider it from the very beginning like a cost which you have to earn and not as something which is nice uh, to have as an outcome at the end of the year. As you spoke about profit and that speech, what was coming to mind for me is that you know, when people you were saying they, they think the average profit uh, margin is 20%, 30%, whatever it is, that they that that consumers also must have 
thought of prophet as a dirty word in so many absolutely so many words you know well, quite a few actually said i i have no idea i don't want to talk about prophet i don't give answers on prophet and um I was at a, at a shareholder meeting of Bayer Bear, the pharmaceutical chemical company, and I discussed with, uh, with some people there about profit, who demonstrators, and they almost attacked me because I said the company must make profit, etc. I was in real danger there. So companies like that were maybe are, are afraid, afraid of talking about profit to the public. Yes, absolutely. Talk to profit, talk to investors, to analysts, etc. in investors' calls, but they shy away from talking about profit, from publishing their profit. And there are two reasons, actually. The ones who have high profits, they don't want to create social envy. And the ones with low profits, which is the majority, they are ashamed to re reveal how low <laughs> their profits are. <laughs> Actually, that in the inflation book, that uh, CEOs and companies should be more transparent with their profitability. If the workers, employees know that there is only a margin of 5%, they behave differently as if they know that they, there would be a margin, they think there would be a margin of 20%. And if you think you have only a margin of 3 or 5%, under inflationary conditions, you are actually living with a very high risk. Yeah, there's not a lot of margin to play with. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, let's move on to the question about Simon Kutcher and partners and the rest of the decade, right? We have eight more years uh, in, in the 2020s. What do you look at as it's, and you're still involved, somewhat in Simon Kutcher, or how would you exp how would you characterize your involvement? I am not operationally involved in the uh, in, in in consulting project or in the day to day management, but I have a lot of discussions uh, with the partners, with the leaders of the company. Uh, I participate in the partners' meetings and I express my opinion whenever something comes up where I think I, I should say something. But I'm also a little withdrawn because I don't want to intervene all the time as the, the old guy. One road for the future, which I, I supported over the years, uh, is that we will continue with our globalization. I said we have three offices in China. We are just preparing opening offices in South Korea, in India, and in South Africa. This will add up the number of countries where we are active to 31 then. And uh, it also means that we are going into Africa. We have an office in Cairo, but that's not real Africa. And India is, of course, a very important market of the future. So globalization will continue. That will be a very important driver, digitalization and its effect on pricing will be an equally important driver. And the condition to, to keep on being successful is that we find the right people in these countries. That is the, the bottleneck in globalization. It's not capital in our business. We don't need much capital. It's not infrastructure. It's finding the right people, bringing them on board not only in terms of cognitive knowledge, but also in terms of our culture. And how easy or difficult is it uh, historically been to find the right people? It went actually quite well. When I think of our first foreign office in the US and what helped immensely in this early stage for us, my connections to top business schools where we could recruit some people and uh, they stayed on board. The first two guys I hired in the US in 96, they just, uh, they, they worked their whole life for some, they just retired a year ago. So they worked for the next 25 years uh, for Simon Kutcher. The same in France. In France, I recruited two guys in 19, 1998 and they are still on board. They are now in their, in their 50s, of course. 
was 25 years ago. And so the university, you know, connections um, and, and relationships with professors of strategy, marketing, pricing, uh, if there are professors of, of pricing, sound to be very important in getting people at this, you know, in the in the business schools. It was particularly helpful when we started new in a country because we were not known. And I was, I had connections to the universities and professors who recommended us to uh, some good graduates. That was extremely helpful in the early years. And that'll uh, keep going over the next eight years for Simon Kuchar. I mean, as you expand into India and other countries, I guess you, you want to establish or you are establishing relationships with those professors whose students. Uh, it's, it's less important today because now we have a size and a marketing power also for, for top talent, uh, which uh, allows us to, to get good people and uh, keep them on board. Of course, keeping them is equally important. That is a matter of leadership and corporate culture. And of course, as everybody knows, in the consulting industry, the churn rates are relatively high. And if we can keep them below the industry average, uh, that's already, already good. And we are working hard to achieve that. Absolutely. And what about thought leadership for the rest of the decade? How important is that for Simon Kutcher? Uh, uh, is it of equal importance as, you know, with the last uh, 37 years or more important to publish books and articles and speak at conferences, how important is thought leadership? Over I, there? I think it's even more important because we have so many innovations. When I, I think of how is artificial intelligence influencing pricing, we already have done a couple of projects and we detected things which we would never have detected manually. Big data analysis, where they, uh, the algorithm finds correlations, causalities between certain factors. Just to give you an example, for a fast food company, we analyzed uh, the effectiveness of promotions. We found out that in, 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 in this country, when there is a major soccer uh, game in that city, in, in, in these cities where are major soccer games on so the, the first league, the promotions are extremely effective. Nobody would ever have found that out by, by thinking or manually doing the analysis, but the algorithm finds that out. Blockchain, smart contracts where price adjustments are made if certain conditions uh, develop and, and uh, the, the decision is linked to that. So uh, these are totally new fields. And uh, it's, of course, a big challenge for us to keep to defend our law, uh, thought leadership related to pricing and to growth. So you can't just stay still with all the books that you guys have published. You know, you can't say, look, look at all the books we published, the articles. We're, we're, we're largely done. We'll live off that for the next eight no. years. No, that's always uh, the state of the art of the day when the book is published or a little earlier when the book is, uh, the manuscript is finalized. And then two or three years after, we are, for instance, working on the fifth edition of the German price management book, this textbook. And you cannot imagine how many changes and innovations we have. The last uh, edition appeared in 2016. Uh, we didn't mention artificial intelligence as related to pricing. Now we'll have a, a chapter on artificial intelligence and pricing. Uh, that's a challenge uh, for me, of course, at my age. I cannot say that I fully understand Bitcoin, blockchain, uh, quantum computing. And I feel somewhat uneasy, but we have younger people who are competent and understand this. And so we work together to produce articles, books, speeches, which uh, pick up these new topics. Yeah, yeah. Now, all right, so that leads to the last question here. So for, for the rest of this decade, if you plan to keep researching and writing, and I hope you do, what topics hold your interest now and over the rest of this decade? What, what would you most like to research and write about? I, I, I see... Three, three categories. Um, one is 
that I, I pick up current topics. For instance, this inflation book. My publisher asked me, why don't you write a book on inflation? And I delivered the manuscript in exactly five weeks. How can I do that? Because I have all this experience. I am only uh, one of the few guys who still have experience from the inflation of the 1970s. So that will happen from time to time. Uh, for instance, I have a lot of discussions about China. How is this going, the relationship to China? Uh, that could lend itself to a book around the hidden champions uh, thing. Uh, the most recent one is actually this one, Hidden Champions in the Chinese Century, which came out a month ago or so. So current topics. Another area where I may write something, or at least articles, is learning from my experience over 50 years. Uh, my, my autobiography goes a little in, into this direction, but I also wrote another book on, on the society in my childhood and, uh, and youth, which was like the Middle Ages. What are experiences you can draw from these uh, events, from these uh, eras? And um, then more challenging for me, capturing the future. A few years ago, I wrote a book in German, Business Trends of the Future. Uh, where I, I, I quite well predicted the development of globalization, also the increasing involvement of government. I, I, I would not write about quantum computing or blockchain, but right now I have so many thoughts about the Ukraine war and Russia. How do we deal with Russia in the future? And I write articles on it uh, that this may not turn. For instance, I published an article in the main uh, German newspaper, the national newspaper Frankfurter Allgemeine, Allgemeine, Russia, poor and dangerous. And right now we make Russia even poorer, we become more dangerous. It's like an African state with nuclear weapons, or we are just making big mistake in Germany. We have all the sanctions on Russia, and have not thought that Putin has a more powerful sanction against us because 50% of our natural gas comes from Russia. So he may stop, he has already partially stopped the gas delivery. It's, it's we, we have no idea how we can overcome the winter without gas heating and gas for industrial purposes. So I, I, I think and comment a lot on these small general issues, difficult uh, problems related to development in the future. Yeah, the, the, the geopolitical problems seem to be as acute as I have seen them in the last 50 years. Yes, yes, it's many, many things that are co coming together. COVID-19, uh, supply chain, uh, conflict, US, China, uh, migration, Africa, then the Ukraine war, and uh, it's it's a little too much. Also, one of the most serious problems, the bloated money supply. I expect that inflation will uh, stay with us for the next 10 years at least. And that'll be difficult for, for the country, yeah. right? So it doesn't sound like you want to retire uh, from your <laughs> research or writing. As long as I can think, I will try to. Well, yeah. listen, I want, I want to thank you for your, your, your wisdom and your time. And, um, and we will check in with you to talk about your next book uh, when, when it hits the market. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. Very enjoyable as always with you. Thank you. It was a true honor interviewing Herman Simon of Simon Kucher and Partners. He is truly a legend in the consulting industry, carving out a very lucrative niche in pricing consulting and helping build a firm that today is a half a billion dollars in revenue. Herman is still involved in Simon Kutcher, but he is even more involved in continuing to research pricing, business, and other issues and publish books. Thank you, Herman, for a great interview and hope to connect soon.